covered politics for a while. Yeah. When a candidate says something like that, no, I'm not a know-it-all, it might come from research that shows that no. voters are concerned about that. Why did you say that then? It actually didn't show up in any polling numbers, but I understand if I was looking at myself after the first debate, to be really honest with you, and I didn't know me, that's what I would have thought. How come? Well, look, I think that I'm a new guy. People, I have no voting record in legislatures or in the Senate or a governing track record. I do have a business track record, but people aren't familiar with that. And so I understand if I were sitting at home and seeing a 38-year-old guy who's on stage for the first time and you have heard of him not before, I get that I have to earn the trust of people in this country. And I think a big part of it is that we've already been reaching a lot of younger audiences through social media more effectively probably than many modern campaigns. But most of the Republican primary voter base is not reachable that way. And so I wanted to be candid with people that this is a process. I wasn't in tonight to have one moment. This is part of a steady climb to what I believe will be winning the nomination and reuniting this party and then reuniting this country. And I think that was my mentality on the stage tonight. I'm really pleased with how it went. When you came over here, you said to me, that uh, from your perspective, phase one of your campaign is coming yes. to a close and now you're in phase two. Can you explain what that means? Well, most people who come out of nowhere, like me, seemingly at least out of nowhere, in March when I'm polling at 0.0%, would not be at this phase of the campaign. And so that means we need to talk to everybody at all hours of the day. One of the things I've realized about myself, though, Dana, is that I'm at my best when I also create space to actually remind myself to think, to have the vision of this campaign and so of where we're going. And so we're not going to be doing media frenzies or anything going forward. I'll talk to everybody. Left-wing, right-wing media doesn't matter. But I'm going to focus more on what is day one going to look like. And not only just what is day one, what does January 2033 look like? When I leave that office, after two terms hopefully, what do I want to tell the people of this country that we did? From here on out, that's actually my focus. And there's a little bit of a chicken and egg when you start a campaign as an outsider like this. I think we have achieved critical velocity, but now I'm not in this to just be here. Mm -hmm. I'm in this to lead this country and hopefully, dare I say it, reunite this country. And I think that's going to be a different side of me that I hope that people get to know over the course of the next few months. Okay, before you get even yeah. close to what you just described, you very well know that you're going to have to uh, secure the Republican nomination. Yes. You, just like the first debate, uh, there were some knives out for you tonight. Yes. And one of the things that we heard from Nikki Haley and I believe uh, Mike Pence was criticism of you when it comes to China. Yeah, that's Th puzzling to me, but that's okay. Well, the, the idea is that when you were- I did do business in China, that's true. Okay, and so first of all, is that criticism fair? Should you not have done business in China? I don't, I wouldn't say that. I'll admit mistakes, but that's not a mistake because every American CEO was expanding into China and so I was among them. Why did you pull actually, out? Actually, I'm proud of it because I saw what the expectations are if you're doing business in China. You can't criticize- Expectations by the Chinese you can't even or America? By the Chinese. You can't criticize the CCP. So when I started my next business, not only did we pull out from the first business, when I started my second business, Strive, I became actually the first leader of an asset manager to say we would never build an asset management business in China. That was unique. I've probably been the most outspoken CEO in America about the risks of doing business in China. And as those other governors criticized me, I was thinking about firing back. Each of them has invited Chinese investment into their states, no doubt about it. But I didn't think that was a good use of time on the debate stage. There was a lot of people going back and forth. I don't think that makes the Republican Party stronger. Well, they said that you pulled out your businesses of China because you were turning your attention towards running for political office. No, it's false, actually. It's just, it's just blatantly false. But... My view is these personal attacks are meaningless. I've actually made harder commitments than most CEOs. There isn't a CEO in America, I think you're going to find, who has been more openly critical of the CCP. And in the spirit of the Reagan Library tonight, here's my view on foreign policy as well. As Reagan said it about the Soviet Union, what did he say? His vision was, we win, they lose. People laughed at him when he said it. They said, he, like for me, he's an outsider, a simpleton. Well, he actually got that done. And I say that for the Communist Party of China today. That's my strategy. We win, they lose. And I understand it deeply enough to actually lead us to get there. There was another comment that you made tonight that uh, caught my attention. Yeah. You said transgenderism, especially in kids, is a mental health disorder. Yes. How do you know that? Well, it's up through the DSM-5, it has been characterized as a mental health condition. And I come from a place of compassion here. I do not think we're doing these kids a favor when they're confused to say, oh, let's affirm your confusion. 
instead of asking an open question, what else might be going wrong in that kid's life? You know, the fact that schools hide that from parents, I think, is, is wrong. It wasn't that long ago that many people in America thought being gay was a mental health disorder. I think there's a fundamental difference here. Unlike for being gay where there's no genetic basis for it, here you have a genetic basis for your gender. Two X chromosomes, you're a woman, an X and a Y, you're a man. Are there rare cases of XXY and XYY? Sure. But that's a fringe case, and I've said in other but forums. But you understand that's that there are point. people who, who make but the very difficult is, choice to change their gender. Yeah. They don't think that it is a choice. So let's at least draw some boundaries here. Let's, let's, let's just, and that's not mental health. Sorry, so how do you respond you, to that? With due respect, I would say let's draw some boundaries. Kids aren't the same as adults. Okay. And so the fact that I have met young women, I met, mentioned two of them on stage, Chloe and Katie, in their 20s, who now regret having gone, undergone both of them double mastectomies, one of them a hysterectomy, one who won't have children, the other one who will never breastfeed her children, who regret it now. That's not something we should allow kids in this country to do, just as you can't get a tattoo so just to clarify, before the age of 18. You're talking about children. Yes. Uh, well, first of all, why shouldn't it be a parent's decision with the family and the doctor? Why is it the government's decision? There, I mean, you're a conservative. Why should I the am. government be involved? And it's a fair question, but I think that there are certain boundaries we draw to say that you can't allow a parent to allow their child to engage in abusive or self-abusive behavior. In other contexts, you can't get a tattoo in most states in this union until the age of 18. There are real hard lines. You can't smoke a cigarette just because your parent gives you one. So I do think that we have to protect children. I am a free market person. I do believe that if you want to dress how you want, wear a skirt, if you're a man, I'm not going to stop you from doing it. But you're also not going to change the norms and language of our country or how women compete in sports or how people go to which locker rooms they go into. That's not protecting against the tyranny of the majority. What that's really doing is creating a new tyranny of the minority. And I do think it's important to be vocal about that. One last question, just to make sure that I understand your position. You're talking about children. What yes. about adults? If somebody who is 18 and older uh, is transgender, is that a mental health disorder? It's my belief that it is. That is my conviction. I think it's a lot of psychiatrists for most of the last century have. But, but a lot of psychiatrists but, 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 but it's not my last job. century but, thought, thought gay well, I think people I'm going to say something you may, may agree with me on, issues. Dana. It's not my job to be the psychiatrist for every adult in this country. Okay. I'm running for president of the United States. We live in a free country. We will treat every person with dignity. But that doesn't mean that that person gets to change our language or the way women compete in sports or otherwise. So that's the way I'll govern as a leader of this country who respects individual freedom but also respects the idea that we have to protect children because kids aren't the same as adults. And I think most people, even friends on the left, I think quietly agree with me on this. Just think about this issue for a second. If we're to, you brought the gay issue a couple of times. Mm -hmm. The same movement that said the sex of the person you're attracted to is hardwired on the day you're born is now the same movement that says your own sex is totally fluid over the course I, of your life. And I think that we have to at least acknowledge there's a lot of tension there. And so I know a lot of gay people who are offended by being clubbed into the same group through the LGBTQIA plus alphabet soup. And so I think we have to start treating people as individuals with respect and dignity. Yeah. And I'm in this to unite the country, but I'm also going to speak the truth at every step of the way. This, is, this conversation didn't go as, as, as I expected to have this debate, but all I will just say, and I want to yep. end it here, is that my impression is that people who are gay talk about how they, uh, who they're attracted to. People who are transgender is, they're talking about how they feel themselves. Uh, last, last question, just to put a button on this discussion about tonight. Um, do you feel that the dynamic really changed tonight, especially with Donald J. Trump not on that stage? I think it did. I think that I am on a steady climb to be our nominee. The person who wins the Republican nomination is not going to do it without the America First base. I was the America First conservative on that stage. And if you look at my closing remark, I was very clear. Unlike everybody else on that stage who was implicitly bashing Trump, I recognize that he was an excellent president. But I am in this race to unite this country. And that will take someone of a different generation. And I think we go further with our America First agenda if we're united. And also, if many people, independents and even Democrats, are honest about it, I think there are parts of the America First agenda that many of them agree with, too. And so, yes, I will first reunite this party, and then I will reunite this country. I will honor Donald Trump's legacy as we do, because I think that's the right thing to do. But I believe I will take this to the next level and unite all Americans by reaching in part the next generation. And that's the phase of the campaign we're in now. Vivek Ramaswamy, thank you so much thank for you. coming over. Appreciate, I appreciate it. it. Good to see you. Thank you.